Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is Rajan Dravel from Ibipsa Education Committee. I welcome uh, our friends from Carlton University and uh, they, they participate in uh, Ibipsa conference where we had a student modeling competition and they were chosen as a winners of the competition. And I'm very glad that they are going to share their experience and their design presentation and what work they did with all of us. So with this, uh, I'll introduce uh, Liminita. Uh, all of them are doctoral students. They are doing the PhD at the Carlton. And I, uh, I invite Liminita to start presentation. Uh, I'll actually start talking because we we uh, practiced yeah. that I start. So <laughs> hi. Um, so on the phone we have uh, Tarek, Lumi, Michael, and Larissa, and I'm Adrian. And today we'll be talking about uh, uh, the student modeling competition. Uh, Lumi, are you able to just move the go to webinar box off of the slide screen? Yeah, just move that out of the way. Hi. Hi. Cool. Um, so I'll pass the slide of the presentation on to uh, Lumi, where she's going to talk a little bit about the it's context of the project. It's not moving, the presentation. It's gone now. I don't see it anymore. Okay. Luminita, you need to unmute yourself before you speak. I am muted, but unfortunately the presentation is not uh, the okay. So I have to use my mouth. Oh, sorry. So I will start uh, introducing the, the building itself. It's a 17th century palace in historical center of Rome. Uh, presently, the building is hosting offices and classrooms, and uh, it has five floors. So we have a round floor, three identical floor, and an attic. The building is a masonry construction with the single glazed windows and the wooden frames. The decision process we follow to complete the project can be organized mainly in three phases. The first phase was the project set up when the scope of work as well as the main constraints were identified. The second phase was the energy modeling and performance assessment itself. It was the most complex one when the baseline model was developed, the sensitivity analysis was run, the resolution was selected, and also a daylight and visual comfort assessment was performed. And finally, the last one was the design optimization and prioritization. I will talk shortly about the first phase, the scope of work and objectives of the project. So we kind of wanted to identify the best retrofit design solution to minimize the energy consumption of the building while maintaining or even improving the occupant comfort. Equally important was also to preserve the character defining elements that convey the building sense of place and time because we are dealing with a historical building and this is important. Uh, among the constraints was uh, um, the most important was, was the compliance with the guidelines on retrofit design of historical buildings. As you probably know, the whole historical center of Rome, it's a world heritage site and it has to comply with specific management and conservation plans. So uh, whatever we are proposing as retrofitting measure should be in compliance with these principles. Um, the exact location of the building was unknown, preventing us to identify the most important character defining elements of the building. As such, based on some studies from literature review, we, desi we decided that the most important fact is to preserve the exterior aesthetic and fabric of the building. And now Larissa will start discussing the phase two of the project, the actual energy modeling. Okay, so phase two began with the creation of the baseline energy model. Get using the given information, 
such as the material properties, schedules, internal heat gains, lighting and plug loads, heating system type, geometry, and weather files. Oh, am I using your microphone? Because I hear the echo. Yeah, okay, one second, sorry. You are, you are audible right now, so please go ahead, no, no worries. Okay, so the okay, so the the tools that we use for our performance performance assessment were uh, SketchUp for the geometry, Open Studio for the model input parameters, Energy Plus for other model input parameters, depending on the availability of resources and the ease of use of the tool. And then we used MATLAB for the sensitivity analysis. We created our own script. And we also used GenOpt for the optimization analysis. So the approach that we took to creating the geometry was to simplify the reality so that our model would not be too complex. And this would reduce the potential for errors in the model and also reduce the simulation time. So we traced the scaled architectural drawings from the center of the walls in order to consider the thermal mass of the masonry of the building. We also considered the adjacent buildings, which you see are the purple figures in the model. And this was to consider the reduction in the solar heat gains, solar radiation, daylight, long wave radiation, and wind. And we modeled the pitched roof as a flat roof to reduce the model complexity. And we thought this was a, an okay approximation since the pitch was quite low and we were able to use an equivalent volume for the roof space. The zoning strategy that we used was to group similar spaces with similar internal gains, ventilation requirements, schedules, and occupancy. And this resulted in three main thermal zone types of classrooms as the first one, offices, the second zone type, and corridors, stairs, restrooms, and utility closets all grouped as the third zone type. We initially uh, had all these last few spaces separated, but this resulted in simulation run times of over 30 minutes. And that wasn't feasible for the number of simulations we were going to be running for the sensitivity analysis and the optimization analysis. So we decided that these spaces were similar enough in their schedules and internal gains and everything. So we just averaged these and grouped them together. And the image that you see here is of the typical floor and the zoning that resulted from our zoning strategy and that resulted in about seven zones per floor. And we further divided the, the zone types by orientation in the building. So that's why we have this many zones. And you'll also notice that the corridors were split in uh, by the orientation as well. And this was to accurately model the natural ventilation in the building. Our modeling techniques that we used for the building interactions with the environment were 2D heat transfer to the ground, LBNL window to input window frame and glazing properties into Energy Plus using the complex fenestration model, an airflow network for the air infiltration around windows and interzone airflow in Energy Plus, and the, uh, the HVAC templates in Energy Plus in order to model the heating system. So now Michael will talk about the actual performance assessment that we conducted. So once we had a working model, we had to examine what the results were telling us. Well, uh, what areas of concern are there in the building? And is our model realistic for a, a building of this typology and in this type of climate? Um, this was compounded by the fact that we were given uh, no measured data um, such as, uh, you know, annual heating loads or even um, what, what was the typical indoor climate in the building. So what, one of the first things that we 
we looked at was the indoor temperatures. Our preliminary model was returning temperatures that inside the attic upwards of 40 degrees Celsius in midsummer. This is obviously uncomfortable. Um, and occupant comfort was therefore a concern. Um, so this is shown on the left uh, figure. Um, uh, the attic zone temperature in blue and the outdoor temperature in orange. Uh, we see that there's a large diurnal spike in the uh, model temperatures. We also looked at uh, the monthly energy consumption and we identified that heating and lighting energy could definitely be improved. Uh, based on our observations, um, we identified some improvements that could be made to our preliminary model to make it resemble reality more accurately. Uh, the first thing we did was we uh, increased the thermal mash of some of the building assemblies. Uh, one example is the interior walls. Uh, in the uh, submission uh, package, we were, the walls were drawn quite thick, and uh, we assumed these to be mass masonry instead of uh, a contemporary lightweight partition. This would have increased the thermal mass in each zone, and this would have helped to quell some of the extreme temperatures that we were seeing inside the zones. Uh, another thing we added was operable blinds to control the amount of solar gains entering the zone. Uh, these operable blinds were uh, triggered when a certain uh, threshold of solar radiation was incident upon the windows. Another thing we added was daylight controls to turn off these heat generating lights uh, when they were not required. This would help to reduce lighting energy and also uh, reduce the peak temperatures in the zone. Uh, the last major improvement was to introduce an airflow network to model natural ventilation. Um, an airflow network calculates air infiltration based on pressure differentials between zones and the exterior based on wind velocity or stack effects. Uh, all windows in the building were modeled as hung windows, which were opened halfway when the zone temperature reached a, a certain threshold, allowing advection to cool the building in summer. So when the window is closed in winter, as in uh, the image on the left, um, air infiltrates around the perimeter. In energy plus, this can be modeled with what is known as an air mass flow coefficient. Uh, no information was given to us on the air tightness of the building. Um, so we assumed that with all windows closed, the air, uh, we wanted to achieve an air change rate of between three and six air changes per hour. To achieve this, we uh, basically fine-tuned this air mass flow coefficient until we got inside this range of three to six air changes per hour. Um, we chose the, this range of three to six air changes per hour um, to be appropriate for a building of this age and of this construction. Okay, um, based on this, we, we found we have four key objectives to achieve in our, our modeling project. Number one was to reduce heating energy use. Number two was to reduce lighting energy use. Uh, three was to reduce peak operative temperatures during summer. And four was to maintain natural ventilation as the cooling method rather than introduce a mechanical system. When dealing with uh, occupant comfort, uh, we use the operative temperature. So the, this is the temperature that the occupants feel as the basis for all our assessment. Uh, an adaptive thermal comfort model was used as well. Um, an adaptive thermal comfort uh, model basically says uh, when the outdoor temperature is higher, uh, occupants are willing to tolerate a higher indoor operative temperature. Before designing an optimized retrofit model, uh, we performed a one factor at a time sensitivity analysis uh, to determine which model parameters had the biggest impact on uh, the model. Uh, parameters included those related to the mechanical system, window construction, uh, thermal insulation, and lighting. The impact on heating loads, uh, lighting loads, and the peak temperature inside the building was measured for each change in parameter. <coughs> Some parameters, such as air tightness and the boiler efficiency, had a large impact, while others, such as solar reflectance of the roof tiles did not. Other parameters had contrary impacts. 
So for example, the adding uh, XPS insulation to the wall, we found that the heating energy was reduced, but we had the negative side effect of the indoor operative temperature increasing quite significantly as well. Parameters which did not have an impact were excluded from our optimization process. The sensitivity analysis also gave us insight into some diminishing returns. Uh, an example being windows. So we designed a, a series of windows from a, a more basic to a more advanced window. So if, for example, we modeled uh, double pane windows, uh, double pane low E, triple pane, uh, some spectrally selective windows. What we found was that the, uh, the benefits to these more advanced windows were marginal compared to uh, uh, something more basic like a double pane window or a double pane low E window. Considering uh, the additional cost of these windows, uh, concerns over heritage, uh, we removed these more advanced windows from consideration and optimization. Now I will proceed to uh, uh, give the floor to Adrian who will talk about daylighting analysis. Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, so thank you, Michael. Part of the scope of the work for the project was also to uh, look into indoor environmental quality. Uh, and part of that is looking at daylighting specifically. Now, um, what we were interested in doing is trying to facilitate a radiance or radiance-based ray tracing analysis. And uh, what we decided to do is use Energy Plus initially, and then uh, move into a more zone specific uh, analysis where we used Revit and the visual programming language Dynamo to facilitate a, a radiance based daylighting analysis using the app called Honeybee, which is a tool that can be used within the Dynamo programming environment. And we really wanted to look at uh, glare as well as the actual illuminance within the space. So if you go to, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, what we did is we used uh, Energy Plus to do a building wide analysis of the light properties using zone sensors actually placed within the model. Uh, we set that up using Open Studio and then uh, which then controlled the, the Energy Plus model. Um, and we were surveying every single zone for daylighting uh, in terms of average work plane illuminance, as well as a predicted glare index. And we found that there was one zone in particular that was the outlier. Most of the zones were actually quite dark, as you can see on the uh, graph just to the left. But, uh, and spaces that are darker, can just be supplemented with electrical lighting. So we were actually more concerned with glare and uh, too much light in specific cases, especially given that the building is, is mainly hot. We wanna make sure that people aren't overheating and experiencing all this overbearing uh, sunlight. We found that one zone in particular was the was of concern and that was the northeast facing zone um, and as we discussed briefly just before we had to model the surrounding buildings and the surrounding surfaces as shading objects so uh, contrary to your intuition given that it's a north facing building um, the zone at the this zone in particular experiences the most glare and the most light overall so we decided to do an hour by hour analysis of this one particular space just to see how severe the glare actually was now if you look at it you can see that um, it's localized pockets of extreme light uh, just right near the windows. So after kind of discussing and looking at the results of this particular space, we decided that the only really appropriate recommendation we could make is operable blinds. And that's because any other rigid shading system, whether it be fins or a light shelf or what have you, those are very invasive to the heritage fabric of the building. And as a result, we can't afford to be too invasive 
meaning that the blinds are the most appropriate option, especially since we don't know what the layout of this building is in terms of this space and all the other spaces. So uh, daylight comfort also heavily relies on interior design and where the, the where people will actually be statically located. And if we don't know that, we can't make any other recommendations. Um, if you could go to the next slide. We also wanted to uh, maximize the amount of on-site power generation. Um, so one thing that we re noticed is that there was a flat area on the building that uh, is not really seen from street level. And so we feel as though we recommend to put uh, solar panels on that flat area and that produces energy without uh, significantly impacting the view planes from the street or the exterior appearance. Um, and doing this analysis, we found that it would cost about 70,000 euros and the payback period for the solar panels would be approximately five years. I'll now pass it on to uh, Tarek, who will be talking about our optimization process. Based on our sensitivity analysis uh, we conducted, we were able to uh, shortlist the most influential energy conservation measures or uh, upgrades to the building. So the next step was to uh, proceed and uh, do an optimization, try different combinations of these energy conservation measures or upgrades. So since there will be like a, a, a large number of combinations, we decided to proceed using a mathematical uh, optimization. We used GenOpt <clears throat> as our optimization tool which uses a particle swarm uh, optimization alg algorithm. And for optimization, we had to set up a cost function. And we decided that our cost function should, uh, should include uh, energy performance and an indicator for the comfort. So we set up our cost function to be equal to heat heating energy use intensity, uh, plus the lighting energy use intensity, plus the uh, the, op the maximum operative temperature, and you can see that there's a multiplier uh, with the operative temperature. We know that uh, this is just to maintain a, like a sort of balance in our cost function, and uh, we decided to have our uh, performance metrics or performance indicators to be the uh, the, or the total energy use intensity and the operative temperature uh, reduction. Thanks. Uh, is the Luminita who is going to speak next? We stopped hearing. Uh, based on the uh, optimization results, we were able to uh, to reduce the operative temperature in most of the building zones. And we can see an example here on the graph. We were able to cut the peak operative temperature in the attic, which was the worst case, uh, substantially. The other thing... Uh, uh, resulted from the optimization uh, process was we were able to cut the heating energy use intensity by about 69 to 70 percent and we all uh, also we were able to cut the lighting use intensity by about 80 percent okay so uh, after that we were able to uh, rank our energy conservation measures or retrofit strategies uh, using two different uh, criteria. The first criterion was based on cost from no cost or low cost to high cost and we can see that the no cost it's just applying some control strategies and adjustment to behavior like uh, adjusting the, uh, the sit points or uh, uh, implementing sit back temperatures and the most expensive was uh, installing photovoltaics to generate uh, electricity on site. 
this is a relatively expensive item, but, but uh, if we consider the payback, uh, it worth it. The other criteria was to uh, rank our uh, design upgrades from the least invasive to uh, most invasive. The least invasive was the heating, uh, applying heating sit back and uh, adjusting the schedules, and the most invasive was replacing the existing windows or adding a layer of insulation. So uh, our recommend, uh, we were at the end, we were able to recommend a, a number of uh, low cost, low impact uh, on the building, like uh, uh, deploying daylight controls with 500 lux uh, threshold of uh, lighting with dim uh, and using dimmable lights. Uh, the second thing was improving the air tightness and uh, reducing the air leakage and infiltration in the building and uh, use operable window shades to uh, solve the problem of glare in some zones. And uh, also we recommended a high cost, low impact on building, which is installing the uh, photovoltaics to generate on-site electricity. Uh, the, these will be installed on the flat part of the roof and there will be like uh, an amount of investment there but the payback will be uh, in a short period of time. So overall, now, Audrey, oh sorry, <laughs> thank you Tarek. Um, so overall, this project was a big balancing game of many different components and of issues. First of all, the fact that it is a heritage building means that from the from the get go, we wanted to make sure that we weren't proposing a very invasive recommendations, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't doing anything that would uh, be a detriment to the architectural features of the building in its current state. So that was one of the really important features of this project. Um, in addition to the fact that we weren't given a lot of information, uh, and that's part of the challenge, that's what of the competition, was that um, they provided us schedules and a CAD file that had some of the drawings, but we never actually found out where the building was located. We didn't know kind of any of the other nuanced details of the building, um, which mean that we had to create a lot of assumptions and how to represent it within Energy Plus and Open Studio. Uh, and that made it that made it quite the challenge. Um, we had a lot of issues trying to figure out zoning and geometry. So we spent a lot of time uh, creating the geometry within Open Studio in SketchUp and then revisiting it and uh, kind of figuring out what's appropriate for groupings and, and location because uh, the zoning impacts the accuracy of the results, but also the speed at which the computation runs, which is really um, can affect how our workflow is. So that was really uh, important for us was having the foresight to figure out how detailed we needed to be. Um, another thing is that Michael specifically spent a lot of time uh, modeling the natural ventilation within the building. Uh, so creating an airflow network where each of the zones would um, uh, be connected and trying to represent kind of a real world condition for natural ventilation because we needed to prove that it was appropriate to maintain a natural ventilated system rather than proposing a, a very invasive HVAC system. So that was something that we wanted to put a lot of energy into. Um, and focusing on relative impact on energy. Um, as a group of five, it was also quite a challenge to share the files amongst each other, mainly just because it's such a technical uh, issue, so or a technical challenge. And so that was just kind of the more human aspect is when you're working with five people and uh, someone works on the model, you have to clearly explain what you did uh, the day before. And it's so that was a really interesting uh, part of the project for sure. If you go to the next slide, 
in conclusion, um, the proposed retro retrofit measures meet the requirements and con uh, constraints recommended by the standards of conservation in that area. And we found uh, with our combination of optimized uh, interventions that we can receive or achieve a 69% reduction in heating energy use, an 88% reduction of lighting energy use, and a 9.8 reduction in the operable temperature uh, within the maximum operable temperature during the summer. Um, and we managed to reduce the uncomfortable hours by 50% uh, in each zone. And we uh, think that manually operated blinds would improve the visual and thermal comfort of the zones. And uh, so we hope you enjoyed our presentation and uh, we're open to questions now. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, that was wonderful. In fact, the second last slide was most interesting to me, at least that how did you manage and what are the sort of lessons learned during the process? Uh, let, uh, let, let me open this to um, others who wants to ask questions probably they can use a question pane they can type the question there and then i'll unmute that particular person who wish to ask questions do we have any question from the audience Okay, uh, it's, do we have any question from the audience? Use a question pane to type and send your question, please. Uh, no, there are no questions uh, for, for you. I think it was pretty clear and uh, I hope you have enjoyed the modeling competition. Also, I did meet many of you in Rome. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the place as well. Uh, thanks for sharing your expertise and sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, thank you very much, team. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.